In January of 2003, there was a man named Terry. Uh, he was in the water for over 20 hours after his boat had flipped over. He was trying to survive out there and he confessed later that he thought that he was gonna die and he wasn't gonna make it. And after that long while, there was a helicopter that found him and they sent word to the ship uh, that was on its way to the Persian Gulf. So this ship was on the way to the Persian Gulf already. Uh, the name of the ship was the USS Comforter. Pretty appropriate. Uh, the vessel was on its way to do battle and it paused to get and deliver one man. They went out of their way to save one man and there was a doctor on board who nursed this man who had been in the water almost a full day back to health. Many people today are treading water. They don't know how much longer they're gonna be able to hang in there. People are tired and sometimes they feel like all is lost. We've gotta look up and see that our deliverer is nearby. He knows exactly where deliverance can be found and the God of all comfort will make sure the comfort we need will come our way. You know that Paul said this in Philippians 3, uh, and it's, uh, we went through a series last year about how we can pray the whole Bible. You can pray any verse in the Bible when you understand it properly, and it's really opened up a lot of our prayer lives as we went through that discipleship series. Um, but there's this one verse in Philippians 3 I struggle with praying with. I'll, I'll just be real honest with you. Because like you, I don't even enjoy the subject of suffering. It's not a feel-good uh, conversation, but it's something we've got to be ready for, whatever happens in our life. Uh, but Paul had said in Philippians, in his letter to Philippi, he said that everything that was gained to me, and he had accomplished so much before trusting Christ. I mean, he had the, he had the world. Uh, but everything that was gained to me, he says, I consider to be a loss because of Christ. So he's lost everything because of following Christ, but Christ is greater than anything the world has to offer. He says, more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung. He says, I, can, I consider them as feces just so that I can fully gain Christ and know him. And he says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law. None of you here who are declared righteous before God have any righteousness on your own. It's, as we talked about Wednesday night, it's an alien righteousness. It comes from the outside in. It comes from the person of Christ, the Holy Spirit, who gives you His righteousness when you trust Christ. He says, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. We trust, we believe in Jesus based on faith. But here's, here's the verse I struggle with praying back to God. I'll, I'll just be honest with you in Philippians 3.10. Paul says, my goal is to know him. All right, I, I'm good with that. I want to know God. But here's how much he wants to know God. And the power of his resurrection. All right, that's good. I, I can pray for that, Lord. I want to know the power of your resurrection. But then he adds in here, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I got to tell you, I have struggled to pray that, that I want to know God. I want to know Him in a greater way. Uh, I want to know the power of His resurrection, and God has shown that in my life and around me. But to say, Lord, I want to know You so well that I'm willing and actually can look forward to whatever sufferings and causing me to have greater fellowship with You. Because our Master uh, was persecuted. He was killed uh, because of who He was. And so when we suffer, we suffer along with Jesus. Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he hasn't already done to a greater degree. But Paul's proclamation, even his prayer here is, he, listen, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings, even being conformed to his death. That causes me great pause. Am I at that place in my life where I'm so abandoned to the person of Jesus that if greater sufferings cause me to have greater fellowship with Jesus, then Lord, bring it on. What a, what a point of surrender to Christ. Here's what I am learning in my life and in, in my wife's life as we have gone through tough times, nothing like Paul, that as we've gone through tough times and brokenness in our life and our family in different seasons of life, here's what I'm learning is that we know Christ better as we walk through those tough seasons than we ever did if life was good and peaceful. When life was good and all the bills were paid and everybody's doing fine, we kind of escape through and, hey, man, nice to have the peace. And, and it's great to have those seasons of peace. But I got to tell you, my walk with Christ has been deepened and strengthened as I've gone through suffering, whether it's directly for Christ, and that has happened 
on small part in a few occasions, but even through the sufferings and trials of life in general. And so we know Christ in a greater way through tough times. Paul also says in another letter, Our, our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, you'll also share in the comfort. When you're suffering for Christ or when you're suffering in life in general, we also realize and can experience the comfort of Christ. And that's happened to me many times and many of you. He also says in his last letter to Timothy, the young preacher, he says, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for what? The gospel. Suffering for the good news. Relying on the power of God. Here's what I believe suffering has done in my life. It's reminding me daily to rely upon the power of God. Because when I think I can handle it, when I'm tough enough or strong enough or smart enough, I'm thinking, man, I'll power my way through it. And, And we're all taught that. Culture teaches us that. But Paul's telling Timothy just months before he gave up his life, he was already in prison when he wrote this. He said, share in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. So when you and I suffer, when you go through trials, I can promise you if you'll turn the right direction at that crossroads of suffering, you will be able to rely on the power of God like never before. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. 1 Peter 5.1 will be in the next couple of weeks. I I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. So Peter realized that he saw the direct sufferings of Christ. He saw it firsthand. He was going through suffering, but he also realizes that he looks beyond that about the glory to be revealed. Here's something that happened in the book of Acts that... The apostles kept talking about the name of Jesus in their life, in their work, in their community. So much so that the the religious kind of police so much took them. And um, uh, they really, here's what they did in verse 40 of Acts 5. After they called in the apostles and they had them flogged. I don't know if you know what the word flogged means, but that's what they did to Jesus before he was crucified. So they flogged these apostles, the disciples. They didn't crucify them, but they flogged them. They, they were beaten with whips mercilessly to the point of that it could have caused death. But they had them flogged, and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they released them. So they said, listen, here's a stern warning. Man, it's going to cost you greatly because you keep talking in the name of Jesus. He says, don't do that. In verse 41, it says, Then when they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, those were the religious leaders, here's what they did. With their backs laid wide open, Blood, broken, bruised, barely able to walk probably. Here was their response. This is next level. When they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Did you hear that? They'd just been flogged. Many people didn't make it through flogging. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Man, that is powerful, my friends. I pause every time I read that in Acts chapter 5, that they were rejoicing because they were worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. And that name is Jesus. And you know what they kept on doing after that? Even more boldly, verse 42. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So they didn't stop. And it cost them more than it's ever cost us. Second Timothy, Paul once again told Timothy, All who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's going to happen. It's not an if, but but it's a a when. It's going to happen. Verse 15 tells us, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. Well, whenever we take punishment for doing something wrong, whether it be evil, whether it be thievery, murder, Meddler getting in other people's business, defrauding people is the implication of that. He says, listen, that's not what I'm referring to now. He says, if you get in trouble for doing wrong, then you deserve it. You're you're getting what you deserve. He says, but I'm talking to you believers that are trying to live for Christ, and it's costing you to live for Christ because you're not going to compromise on what God's Word says. So don't suffer in these ways because that's on you if you suffer as a... As a sinner, as a, th- as a thief, a murderer, an evildoer, a meddler. He says, but in verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, actually the word Christian in the Bible is only used about three times, uh, twice in Acts and then here. We use that word commonly today. We call people Christians. Um, but it was actually a term of derision. It was actually making fun of somebody that they were little messiahs, little Christ. 
Uh, and, and they began to take that, the believers began to take that as a, a beautiful name that, man, I get to be called a Christian. And so, but if anyone suffers as, suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name. Wow. In my house growing up, um, we had a den that was used as um, really the family room where the TV was, where we all gathered. Um, we had some rooms in the house, and you may in your house, some of y'all have that special room that never gets used. It's got all the nice furniture. We don't have that in our home. We have to make it where uh, everybody can sit anywhere because we'll make a mess. But sometimes when you do all your living in one room of the house, the living room may not be named properly if you don't use that. Now, living, if you're not living in the living room, isn't really the life of the house. It's not where we live. Like when I grew up, I, we, we spent a lot of time out in the den. Most folks will live in their own den or their family room. Some of you live in the kitchen. But sometimes there's especially decorated places that are reserved and aren't really used. For many of us, and at times in my life, God's maybe been in my house. I'm talking about me, not the building. But he's just been put away to one area of the house for just special occasions. For you being here today, this is one of those special occasions. It should be a weekly special occasion. That it's the highest priority of your week. But sometimes we relegate God to that area to, hey, Sunday morning, he's here, or uh, I'm here, and, and you know, I, I'm going to listen to God now. But he's only allowed in one part of our house, so to speak. He's not allowed in the center of your house, sometimes called the living room. He's not allowed in places where we live our lives Monday through Saturday. He's not on the center of our lives. He's not on the throne. He's not right in the center of everything we do. And I've been guilty of that in my life. Many followers of Christ say, hey, he's the centerpiece, but he's not really at all. He's only on special occasions. And so my challenge for you today as we finish these moments together, we get ready, ready to remember um, what Jesus did for us that he suffered for us beyond comprehension. And whatever suffering we go through in our life, whether it's our own fault, God can redeem that in crazy ways, uh, whether it's just because life is messy, or whether it's directly for following Jesus as our Savior, Christ says, listen, there's a reason, there's a purpose for this. And we rarely understand it in real time, but don't be surprised when it happens because he's working something, he's purifying, he's testing something in you that could never happen during good times. You see, the last verse that we won't spend a lot of time on today in verse 19 is because those who suffer according to God's will in verse 19 will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. A faithful creator while doing what was good. Do you know that when Jesus finished his last moments on earth before he died uh, for our sins, you know what he said? He said, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And so however tough your life is, God's telling us through Peter's writing here that we can entrust our lives to a faithful creator who loves us. And whatever suffering we go through now is only a glimpse of next to the glory that's going to be revealed in the future. Maybe there'll be redemption that we'll see greater ways here in this world, but ultimately we're not living just for this world. We're living for eternity, and that's what God is preparing us for.